Hello and welcome to another edition of Scroll Books. He was born uh, Sachinanda uh, Hirananda Vatsayan in 1911, and, but rose to prominence as one of Hindi literature's most influential figures under the pen name Ageya, the unknowable. After reading Akshay Mukul's masterful new book, Writer, Rebel, Soldier, Lover, The Many Lives of Ageya, however, You'll come away believing that there's very little left to know about the man. Uh, running really uh, nearly 800 pages, the book seems to uncover almost every detail about the man who pioneered the literary trend known as Prayogvad or experimentalism and was at the heart of the Nai Kavita or new poetry movement. He left his stamp on Hindi poetry, fiction, criticism and journalism but was also a revolutionary during the freedom struggle. In addition to nego uh, negotiating several rather complex uh, romantic relationships. Akshay's uh, conclusion explains why Agay is so compelling, as is Akshay's book. With his eclectic talents and wide interests, his cosmopolitanism and his rootedness, his closeness to power and his rejection of it, Agir is a complicated icon. By shining a light into the many corners of his individual history, I hope the India of his time and ours may appear to be a little less monolithic as well. Congratulations on your new book, Akshay, and thank you for agreeing to be on Scroll Books. Thank you, Naresh. Happy to be here. Yeah. So to begin with, uh, for those of us who are from other linguistic traditions, could you tell us a little about who Agay was and why he's such an icon in the Hindi literary world? Well, Agay, to begin with, uh, was a non-Hindi speaking person. He was a Punjabi by origin who was born in an open field in Kusinagar in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, his father was an archaeologist and epigraphist and that job, father's job took the family to all over the place from Lucknow, Patna, Srinagar to Utkaman, which is Uti. And that's why he landed up in uh, Madras Christian College for his intermediate, where he did science. And um, which, again, was very unlike uh, the, his country, his generation of Hindi writers who mostly grew up in small towns and uh, rural settings. And that part of his cosmopolitanism, his thing comes from this upbringing. And then he goes to... Uh, Foreman Christian College, where he wants to be a physicist, but somehow he, it, does, it doesn't work out. He doesn't do well in his BSc, takes an MA in Eng English, uh, he does in post-graduation, and that's where he gets, gets in close interaction with his revolutionaries. He attends Congress missionary, spends four years in jail, where his name is scientist, because he's supposed to be expert at making bombs. And in Delhi, they had a factory where they used to make bombs and eventually gets arrested, spends four years, comes out. And even while in jail, his literary career started. And that's where he gets his name Agay, given by Prem Chand. And uh, his first story came out when he was in jail. And once he came out and landed in Agra after a few years in Lahore. And after that, he never looked back. He is uh, after Prem Chand. Uh, he's considered is the father of modernism because uh, Prem Chan, uh, death happens in the early 30s and by by then he's already Agge is making mark as a short story writer he has interacted with Agge, uh, with sorry Prem Chan. and by 1941 when his uh, first part of his Sekhar Ek Jibni comes uh, he establishes himself of course the both the left and the right uh, kind of attack him for that and then comes the first anthology which is uh, remarkable uh, it's called tar saptak tar septet seven poets and most of them were leftists uh, out of seven or almost five were uh, died in the old marxist in that collection and that sets up the modernism in poetry and fiction and then subsequently of course he's writing short stories doing journalism he's traveling and that makes him the most starring hindi literature person after prem chand he lords over almost better part of the 20th century yeah that's a gay for you yeah um, what drew you to want to write about his life and how did you go about this prodigious uh, research 
Well, again, someone I have been fascinated by also because the kind of various stories that you hear most of them fiction built by his lovers and those who hate him. And they are actually uh, in equal numbers. If you ask me, Hindi world as it is very factional and very petty fights. Hindi, if you've read the book, which you have, you must have seen Hindi guys always fighting with each other, pulling each one down. And again, <clears throat> is a fascinating person. He is not only a writer. Look at the kind of life he has led. Um, he becomes a revolutionary in the in his uh, early 20s, spends time in jail. He interacts with the whole world. And he's fiercely ambitious about his writing career. And then uh, you find that in, during the Second World War, he takes a position. Unlike other writers who take anti-fascist position, he takes a position and he joins the uh, joins the army, not a, completely in a non combat position but he does so he's uh, putting the uh, you know so he he's doing what others are not and in the process he also gets a uh, flack from everyone so they call him first that uh, they question and rightly so begin with that how come a revolutionary of the 1920s and 30s becomes a British soldier in the 40s uh, but eventually if you come to see what does he gain out of it frankly nothing he's without job then the 50s, when the Congress for Cultural Freedom comes, he's again at the helm of it. And then uh, the, his, mostly his Marxist uh, critics call him CIA agent. And that's something which sticks with him throughout. So look at the life, the trajectory of life that he has led. And when we come to his personal life again, he, is, he had had a fascinating love life. Uh, all exceptionally gifted women he is in love with and he's uh, as I call it extractive and many people ask was it fair to call him extractive uh, he's extractive in relationship and I didn't mean uh, monetarily or financially even though he was relying on most of his women and uh, so first wife then his second stormy relationship he has with Kripa Sain and then he marries again he, he marries his first wife's niece and it was a scandal of the 50s and then he ends up with a even younger woman uh, who's 33 years younger to him, and that's he lives with her throughout his life, the rest of his life. So, so he had that kind of life, and he always kind of was very different. It was not your usual story of a life, and and the kind of scholarship. Uh, he was not a guy who was only writing poetry or fiction. He look at his uh, interventions as a journalist. He and he is the restlessness of a guy. He's launching one journal after the other. And it's not that only he's doing English, Hindi. Look at, at Vak, something which you will uh, kind of, you will find many names which, uh, you know, as a Bombay person, uh, they're they, they writing there, you know, all kinds of people he's getting. And um, so he's experimenting throughout his life, his interventions in literature, journalism, and the life itself. That drove me to kind of uh, Agay. And it all happened. Actually, I was, again, uh, kind of invested in doing another book on Hindu nationalism, which was very different. And then, but, you know, that's meeting with Basuda, which I have mentioned in the book. And she said, I said, why someone is not writing? And she tells me, why don't you write? And then one thing led to another. And uh, then I got fully invested. Five years gone. But yeah, here is a fat book for <laughs> everyone so, to see. Basuda was his last partner's sister who led you yeah. to yeah. his... Yeah. Uh, Eventually, to his okay. private papers, yeah. which you said were yeah. 20 trunks full yes, of private yes. papers and two admirers. Tell us about how you went through that, but that was just the beginnings of it. Then you went to libraries in many parts yes. of the world to piece yes. together the story. Yeah, yeah because his, uh, you know, there were still gaps about him. And if uh, one thing was very clear that I'm not falling for. Uh, the popular narrative about him uh, about him and I also realized i did over 60 interviews and in the end i barely used two three of them because i realized uh, that interview as a tool of research i have my doubts i will not kind of reject it outright i will not uh, but i realized that people for one event if i was interviewing 10 people there were almost 15 versions of it and i realized that and when i was checking the archives I, uh, the final thing was something else and then I realized it's a dangerous territory, especially for a man who kind of such a polarizing figure of Hindi literature. So therefore, I, for instance, his entire revolutionary period, what was happening? You have heard so many tales. And then I realized that the entire archives is in Delhi. 
and people had not seen it. They're running into some 1500 pages, very well kept colonial records. And that solved my story and thing. Then the whole CIA thing. So I, you helped me. You, I remember uh, you uh, couriered me all those books. And then I saw rest of it in Chicago and various other places, you know. Uh, you see Sad Won Gilpatrick diaries in Rockefeller archives. You see stuff in uh, James Burnham papers uh, in um, Stanford. So his stories are all over. And that, that took me, I kind, of became, I kind of became obsessed because I wanted to just solve this and rely less and less on what people had to say because people didn't have always good things to say. And people who love him were, of course, they, they turned him into God. Yeah. And of course, uh, well, one of his partners uh, who was alive didn't want to be interviewed, you said. Uh, yes, and, I uh, tried all the tricks. You are, we are both of us are journalists and you know how often we try various ways to get the story out of people. I tried everything that I learned over two decades in journalism, but nothing worked. I, I gave her various examples of, you know, how that lady uh, regretted when the biography of her uh, former husband came out. So why don't you kind of, it's your time to tell your story. And she kept kind of humoring me. She'll say, okay, I'll think about it. I'll go again after a few months. But eventually she said, well, you just don't understand what love is. And that kind of, I then I realized that she's not talking and I gave it up. Thankfully, some bit, uh, uh, still, uh, I it was more than I expected. Uh, a relationship between her and a gay was in Agay's papers because he was a meticulous collector of papers. So even though she seemed to have walked away with most of her stuff, there was still some lying, which were crucial papers, which helped the court years and the separation later, which Agay wrote to her, you know. So there was enough. Uh, otherwise, yeah, it was tough. It was not getting her was kind of a regret. Yeah, but I mm. tried. Let's skip back a, a, a few to a, a little while to his earlier years. You've so vividly constructed his years in jail uh, after he joined a revolutionary group that may, wanted to make bombs to win freedom. So, uh, could you recount that part of his life for us, please, and how that uh, uh, sparked his early writing? See, his first novel, in fact, which made him famous, which continues to sell like even now in thousands, Sekhar Ekjibni, which is now part of Penguin Classic, Sekhar A Life, which uh, Basuda and one of his students translated. Uh, that's entirely his jail life. And here is a 18, 19 year old boy in jail who thinks that what if I, I kind of, uh, you know, I, am, I, get death, I get death sentence. And then he's recording his dreams. And these dreams are very vivid. They're very graphic. And if you see, I have written uh, about his some of the dream sequences because he's doing something strange about all of us dream. But the moment he wakes up from the dream, he sits down to write in his jail uh, cell. And he writes it. And you can see those I, the original papers he's writing on this court papers, wherever, pencil, pen, whatever he, he can lay his hands on. And that eventually, if you see when he's interacting with uh, this big Hindi writer, Janendra, he is constantly telling him that, look, I'm writing something which is becoming grand. And that is his sacred. So jail is kind of takes him to, um, it, it, it enriches the literature in a big way. Um, there is a story called Kothri. There is a collection called Kothri Ki Baat, which is about his jail. Then, of course, Sekar. Sekar is his kind of monumental work. And in uh, various ways, it's so, it is autobiographical, which he accepted later, which is very clear. Uh, where he also talks of things which was complete taboo in the Hindi literature those days, I guess, across Indian literature, even in England, he's talking about his relationship with his own cousin, and that became kind of scandalous. So jail life kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, built his literary career in a big, big way, and that kind of brought him to, and he, he kept on, and that, you know, that jail thing in various ways, in various forms, keeps coming in his writing for a long, long time, yeah. Uh, you know that uh, Nirval Marma called him the most representative writer of the Nehruvian era. Uh, can you yeah. tell us a little about his relationship with the literary institutions and cultural institutions that were set up in the post-independence uh, period and how they shaped his work and also the work of other writers in that period? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Actually, he is... Um, 
he is taken very seriously by Sahit Academy. He he Nehru is his personal hero, uh, and he is interacting with Sahit Academy in a big way. But he has his problems with Sahit Academy, the manner, and he is generally suspicious of state getting into the realm of literature and art. But having said that. There is also what many of his detractors call a double standard of a gay. He is dealing, he's con he continues to do business with Sahit Academy, be it translation uh, or be it various other things. He has problem with the way Sahit Academy prizes are given. And he points this out that it should not be done. And then when he gets it, he's quiet about it. And so people say, let's look at a gay, he's kind of... Um, Mm, he's okay when he gets it, he's not okay when he, you know, otherwise he criticizes the institution. So these are kind of problems with Agge when it comes to the institution. But deep within, he is suspicious of state. If you remember sometime uh, in the 50s, this big conference happens in Allahabad where all the big writers across languages come, be it uh, Karanth or be it uh, Tarasankar Banerjee, all the big guns of languages. Lang and there, this whole conference is on state and literature, where he's constantly attacking state and he's kind of getting some kind of argument uh, with Mulkaraj Anand. Mulkaraj Anand has a slightly different position, who again is a friend of Nehru, who's very kind of involved with Sahit Academy in many ways. And, and with various other institutions, he, 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 so he's constantly suspicious with government publications, for instance. Uh, and he uses it uh, when he has to, when Asok Bajpayee asks him to write something for his uh, Madhya Pradesh government publication, he says, I don't write for government publications. But that is always not so, because he did write for Ajkal, which is a government of India publication, and uh, various other things. But so despite all his kind of duality on this institution, deep within he remained very suspicious of it and refused to take any position in this, in the, he was part of one committee or the other translation and some advisory board. But he, if you remember, there's one point he tells Krishna Karpalani that I'm no, I'm of no use to these institutions because what I suggest you guys will not do. So he's suspicious, despite having kind of flirted with them, having done business with them. Deep within his, he's not very happy. He wants state to wither away when it comes to literature. And in addition to sort of uh, having this complicated relationship with uh, with the Sahitya Academy in India, he actually has a global network uh, and taps into all sorts of international institutions which allow him to travel and write about it. Uh, tell yes, us about that. That's, yeah, that is again another thing which his detractors point out that how come he is okay with taking Ford Foundation grant to uh, do his travel, you know, writers' workshops which is doing or Rockefeller grants to travel across Asia, Japan, he goes many times and various other things. Uh, and he even individually, but he also builds his network individually. So if you see many of his friendship, many of his, uh, you know, kind of uh, people he got to know during his CCF years, he maintains individual relationship with them. Uh, be it uh, Nabokov or be it uh, Ceylon and various other authors in uh, US and uh, Europe. He keeps in close communication with them and he is not averse to uh, taking such help, uh, as you rightly pointed out. So there is there is a bit of this problem here that he's okay with all these foreign institutions helping. He even wants his novel to come out in England, in US, and they're trying their best, you know, be, be it Asia Society is trying and various other institutions are trying. But he has problem with a lot of the institutions at home, not so much abroad. And um, he builds that network, even the uh, personal network. He is, is pretty well networked internationally. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the CCF, which I think many of our viewers will not be very familiar with, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. And, you know, that's also among uh, the, the, the forums I was uh, interested in. Tell us a yeah. little about this CCF, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, you know, even as many people believe that Indians were paranoid about the foreign hand, actually it turned out that this sort of uh, fear of the foreign hand at its basis in reality. Uh, talk us through through this episode. Yes, it was there. There was a basis in reality. Actually, if you see 1915, uh, it's 
it comes out in Berlin. It, it, it gets established in 1950. And within a, less than a year, you have the Indian unit or Indian kind of counterpart of uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom, which is called Indian Indian Committee for Cultural Freedom. And again, at the helm of it, of course, Minu Masani, the big Bombay uh, liberals are part of it. And uh, again, becomes a secretary. They immediately first meeting they want to hold in Delhi in 1951, which I think barely a week or 10 days left, Nehru cancels it and says, you can't have it in Delhi, you can have it anywhere. And within 10 days, they managed to get everyone in Bombay. And there's this whole detailed account of that report which you had sent me. And um, and you find that people across ideological spectrum are there. Ambedkar is there. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay is there. K. Munsi comes, who is still a minister in Nehru's cabinet. And that becomes kind of um, this whole fear of the spread of communism. It's a paranoia about communism. And you can see everyone attacking communism. Japrakash Narayan is there. And it becomes a very real thing, although uh, Agge had to leave that. He was kind of asked to leave, removed because of Minu Masani, all that because of this Burnham thing which happened. Some money got divert, uh, diverted. But um, it was a very, very important influence in Indian cultural life and later led to Quest. Again, a big journal. If you look at Quest, it's I consider it one of the best journals of its time. Had a very short life, but left a lasting impression uh, beats the uh, encounter in uh, London so CCF played a very very big role and it continued to so while uh, we'll see as I've written as uh, even though Agge's association ends others continue even like big Hindi writer like Ram Riksh Benipuri the entire quest crowd the inner circle of MN Roy, except one person, the entire MN Roy circle walks into the waiting arms of CCF. And subsequently, they are getting these various sinecures abroad. They're getting some job or the other. And they are, mind you, remarkable people. They're remarkable scholars, most of them. And But so CCF had a very, very, very important role to play in the literary, intellectual life of India in the 50s, 60s, and continued till 70s, till... The New York Times broke the story and said that it's CIA funded. And so now everyone said that, well, we don't know it was all this all along, which somehow I am not very, I'm, I still don't believe that they didn't know. Some of them definitely knew that what was happening there, you know. So yes, CCF had a very, very important role to play. Yeah, intriguingly, you note that uh, English was actually Agay's first language and that he could have conceivably chosen to write in English. Uh, what do you make then of his yes. later dismissal of Indian writing in, in, in English? I don't know. This is this is very intriguing. Actually, I tried uh, looking at it very closely. He uh, look at it. Uh, uh, you know, Hindi is not even his mother tongue because he comes up with this thing that, you know, everyone should write in their mother tongue, which is fine. Uh, but he takes to Hindi because his home school, he's learning many languages from Sanskrit to Persian to Hindi. Uh, and later on, it's almost bordering on chauvinism. And he's very, very dismissive of Indian writing in English, Indians writing in English and he does that uh, interview with Duke University later uh, on St. Stephen's uh, College uh, English Department Journal, where again he's attacking them. And he's quite a uh, bit, uh, he's a Raja Rao Sama, who's his friend. He says, okay, he's okay. Mulk Raja Anand, who's his, again his friend, is very dismissive. So this emanates from, I don't know, he, um, this happens sometime, starts in the 60s when he's getting very uh, vocal about writing in your mother tongue. And, uh, and and even though he keeps on saying that I dream even in English, I can even dream in English, which he does. And his felicity with language is like, he could have become an English writer. So this remained very, it's a big curiosity for me, uh, why he became, how he became. Uh, but somehow it takes to Hindi very early. It could be that uh, of all the languages he was learning at home, he, he took to Hindi very early on. He liked. And then in uh, jail, again, uh, he's writing. In, in fact, you know, the draft of Sekhar, the 
first draft of Sekhar is a mix of English and Hindi. And uh, some some bit can just pass over the English novel, you know. But then he chooses. I think it was a conscious decision over a long period of time that becomes his kind of a principal position and he kind of starts articulating it all for and even start attacking Indian writers in English. So, yeah, that, that right would be that, what I... Mm. Yeah. Uh, you write that his concerns in the later part of his life uh, leave him open to appropriation by groups like the RSS, even though he wrote against the RSS. Can you tell us a little more about those concerns and the themes he was writing about? Yeah, see, nine. if you see late 70s onwards, his concerns, again, along with Hindi, another thing which takes him in a big way, and he makes his speeches even in US, one speech he was making in Australian, one Australian university, where he talks of Indianness. Now, what is Indianness? That itself becomes a very problematic construct, if you ask me. Is Indianness, then that Indianness becomes Indianness stroke Hinduness. Because we see it happening, he's moving closer to the ritualistic world. In his earlier writing, there's no nothing you can find. He's very well versed with Indian uh, epics, the uh, religious tradition, which he uses very wisely, very smartly in his literature. But to get into this ritualistic universe, which is so unlike uh, what he was, or for better part of his literary career. And you find him is doing some kind of uh, havan in 85 or 86 when he's in Bikaner. He And the places that he's going, uh, this writer's camp, which is happening in very, uh, you know, be it Ayodhya, be it Dwarka, be it Jan Janak Janki Yatra in Bihar, in Samastipur, and a uh, place where uh, Sita was born. And there, if you, there you find uh, his co-writers, some of them are writing stuff which is problematic. For instance, when they go to Ayodhya, Naresh Mehta writes that looking at the state of the place of Lord Rama's birth, I feel very, very sad. He's uh, Agay is also involved in various rituals that this particular kind of tree should be planted this way, and this is what that tradition says. So yes, it it, it kind of uh, op he opened himself to this appropriation, and top of that. He is he attends one function uh, on uh, one of the RSS function. He even goes to the BJP foundation meeting 1980 in Bombay, where Advani had invited him, and uh, that leads to appropriation. And everyone forgets that the most scathing attack on RSS uh, by Hindi journalists or Hindi uh, you know journalism is by Agge, which is in the 60s when he attacks them. He raises, in the 70s and 80s, he raises questions about secularism. That actually is not problematic. That's something which scholars like Asis Nandi too have raised, that there are problems with the Indian version of secularism. Though they're debatable issues. It doesn't say he's not veering towards a certain thing. But the other things that he's doing, especially through this writer's camp, he opens himself to appropriation. And when he dies, RSS uh, Panjani does a obituary. It's a, it's a big one full page obituary of Agge, where they completely forget what he has written, how he's attacked, that he was a revolutionary, and he had nothing to do with right wing, not nowhere he shows any uh, such, uh, you know, kind of uh, leaning throughout his life. But they used it, how he was a great soldier, great writer, wrote on this, you know, how uh, RSS can, can appropriate, if they can appropriate Bhagat Singh, Agge was a very ordinary then compared to him. So, yeah, they tried to appropriate him. Yeah. When you uh, consider sort of uh, again from uh, the vantage point of uh, India today, what is his legacy? Well, how do we? Uh, how has he left his mark on uh, on on national life and on national cultural life? Well, he was um, he was a liberal in a way. Um, he was a true blue-blooded liberal. If you ask me in all traditions he, despite his what we talked about his his thing about language and uh, this indianness which was a very brief and that's that would be very unfair to judge again on a very brief spells of what happened to his life later on uh in larger if you ask me in in, in overall again remained a liberal a true liberal 
he would have, if he was alive today he would have been very very he would have been an angry old man who completely dismissive of what was happening because one of the things which defines him also that he was a free thinker he was probably the hindi literature's first free thinker so he left behind that huge legacy and you can find that even in hindi literature there are still legatees of agge who tried to write like him uh, <coughs> talk like him and and uh, do a journalism like him many of them of course fail uh, but his mark on literature especially hindi literature remains and he also a kind of uh, uh, left he he left behind uh, this tradition that a writer can be more than one thing you know and which he was he could be a diarist he was a big cultural he, his knowledge about culture and music was second to none he was um, uh and he had become a public intellectual uh, later on life he uh, on larger issues he'll speak so he has left behind unfortunately uh we in hindi literature i will tell you that there are very few uh of of his stature that's happened across languages but definitely in hindi uh who left who nurtured a generation uh, not one but many generation of writers he is probably the first writer of hindi uh and this goes back and i am talking even before during the premchand time who could who was a community who built this community of writers he is constantly talking of uh this building a uh, beat in the 30s when he's out of jail he's talking of building a kind of a place where writers will stay together and he actually does it pratik in ilahabad is a first unique experiment four big writers four big egos are staying in one house which leads to a lot of complication doesn't work he keeps on doing it and even this writer camp is his last intervention how many people get this kind of you know uh, award money and they put their own money and set up a leave a tradition like this and he left behind a huge legacy of mm, making things um, uh, not leaving anything for his family he creates a trust which is a kind of custodian of his papers his entire his state of agge is not held by his family so he he was he left behind that legacy as a writer which we continue to see as a public intellectual and um, and this larger thing so now we see someone like ashok bajpay which he always says that now i am doing what agge wanted to do all his life uh, for writers for across um, and then he will not see he will be very ideology neutral when it will come to helping people malyaj for instance uh, attacked him all his life uh, Malays was a very very bright young uh, writer who died early, and then after his death, you see Agge is trying to help the family, saying at least get his papers out and get his manuscripts published as book. Very few people were. Some say it was his contemporary and a friend. Uh, uh, he goes just before he dies, he wants to go and give money to his to him, meet him in uh, Surinder Nagar in um, Gujarat. So he he does that. So that legacy is there, and Agge will remain in the and. mostly because for the lack of uh, better successors he'll remain the tallest in the writer of the 20th century there's there's no denying that yeah despite all his other problems you know handicaps he's human at the end of it yeah thank you um could we conclude by having you read your favorite agave poem yes i will uh, this is slightly long poem it's called the poem is called notch uh it was written uh, during emergency um it's it came in a collection called mahabriksh ke niche and i'll read now ek tani hui rassi hai jis par main nachta hu jis tani hui rassi par main nachta hu wo do khambon ke beech hai rassi par main jo nachta hu wo ek khambe se dusre khambe tak ka nach hai do khambon ke beech जिस तनी हुई रस्सी पर मैं नाचता हूँ उस पर तीखी रोशनी पड़ती है जिसमें लोग मेरा नाच देखते हैं न ना मुझे देखते हैं जो नाचता हूँ नाचता है न ना रस्सी को जिस पर मैं नाचता हूँ न ना खम्भों को जिस पर रस्सी तनी है न रोशनी को ही जिसमें नाच दिखता है लोग सिर्फ नाच देखते हैं पर मैं जो नाचता जो जिस रस्सी पर नाचता हूँ जो जिन खम्भों के बीच है जिस पर जो रोशनी पड़ती है उस रोशनी में उन खम्भों के बीच उस रस्सी पर असल में मैं नाचता नहीं हूँ मैं केवल उस खम्भे से इस खम्भे तक दौड़ता हूँ कि इस या उस खम्भे से रस्सी खोल दूँ 
कि तनाव झुके कि तनाव चुके और ढील में मुझे छुट्टी हो जाए पर तनाव ढीलता नहीं और मैं इस खंभे से उस खंभे तक दौड़ता हूँ पर तनाव वैसा ही बना रहता है सब कुछ वैसा ही बना रहता है और वही मेरा नाच है जिसे सब देखते हैं मुझे नहीं रस्सी को नहीं खंभे नहीं रोशनी नहीं तनाव भी नहीं देखते हैं नाच दैट्स थैंक यू सो मच अक्षय एंड कंग्रेचुलेशन अगेन ऑन योर बुक थैंक यू एंड इन एडिशन टू एवरीथिंग दैट यू पैक इन to the title uh, he is also a cook a tailor yeah, uh, and so yeah. many other things that you point out yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 thank you yeah, so much for yeah. that uh, conversation and for reading the poem thank you thank you naresh thank you